Welcome to today's Yex Talk, Searching for the Future, Predictions and Big Bets on a Post-COVID World. This meeting is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand at yex.com backslash resources following today's discussion. Please submit questions for Howard Lerman and Scott Galloway using the Q&A function in Vimeo. They'll get to as many questions as they have time for. And now I'd like to welcome CEO and founder of Yext, Howard Lerman. Hi, well, I'm so excited to be here today with Scott Galloway. First, a quick little introduction for Scott, though he needs no introduction. Scott is professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business, but he's also a serial entrepreneur. And in 2012, he was named one of the world's best business professors by Poets and Quants. Scott has founded nine companies, including Profit, Red Envelope, L2, and Section 4. He is the New York Times bestselling author of The Four, The Algebra of Happiness, and most recently, post-corona, From Crisis to Opportunity. He has served on the boards of directors of the New York Times Company, Urban Outfitters, and Berkeley School of Business. His Professor G and Pivot Podcasts, No Mercy, No Malice blog, and Prof G YouTube channel reach millions. And in 2020, Ad Week named Pivot Business Podcast of the Year. Scott, really, really excited to have you here today. Uh, thanks for having me, Howard. Well, you know, I really want to talk about the book. That sounds very, I love the book, by the way, here it is. I got a I hope everyone has their copy or has ordered their book uh, and is reading it. But before we go ahead and talk about the book, I think we just have to talk about yesterday for a minute. So my first question for you, Scott, is Lady Gaga or Whitney Houston in 1992? Oh, my gosh. I think you have to go with Whitney. But I, I, I don't know about you, but and this will obviously reflect my political ideology, but I got emotional yesterday and I remember thinking I cry every four years, but for different reasons. Um, it was an exciting moment, but I also don't think, and part of this is I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. By the way, 90% of people say they're optimists, which is impossible. It's like the 80% of people who say they're above average drivers, but uh, I don't think there was any uh, forgetting, nor should we ever forget that the inauguration yesterday was held in a level, a green level militarized zone, which is a reflection on where our country is right now. So we've got some work to do. But as Nancy Pelosi said in her closing comments today, what a difference a day makes. What a difference a day makes. Yeah, I, uh, I felt the same way. And it was certainly kind of neat to see uh, the change. Um. So let's talk, let's talk before we get to the book, let's talk COVID for a second. So what, what changes, and let's get specific about the vaccine. What changes is Biden going to make to the COVID-19 vaccine rollout? And in your opinion, this is the burning question that I'm thinking about all the time. When do you think everyone that wants a vaccine in America will be able to, to essentially have one? So while I've interviewed people, including Andy Slavitt, who uh, and a bunch of epidemiologists, I want to be clear, I, I wouldn't consider myself uh, an expert on the topic. My my sense is what we saw today that's most relevant to your question and as reason for optimism is that if you go back to World War II, um, kind of nine days post Pearl Harbor, Chrysler announced they were converting one of their factories in Michigan for making uh, Chrysler's to uh, Bradley tanks. And within 11 days, they were punching out tanks. And through the war, that one factory punched out more Bradley M1 tanks than the entire Third Reich. And so the engine of capitalism in America is arguably the most dominant uh, force in history. We didn't win World War II with bravery or even sacrifice, although we brought a lot of those things. We brought it with brute force and the productivity that capitalism creates. And as of today, you're starting to see evidence that uh, the full-throated capitalist response is beginning uh, because there is uh, more comfort amongst the private sector working with the Biden administration. So I think you're going to see 
pop up super vaccination sites and Walmart parking lots. I think you're going to see Amazon leverage what is arguably the most sophisticated, robust supply chain in the world. So if we could do 100 million vaccines in the next 100 days, while it's a little less than a third of our population, it could it could potentially reduce mortality by 80 percent if we get those 100 million vaccines to the most vulnerable and the people who are on the front lines or have a lot of contact with other people. So, look, I'm, I'm that, more hopeful than I've been in a long time. But just to be clear, it's 100 million shots. So it would be maybe 50 million people. Or would it be? Thanks for that. I didn't realize people. that. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't realize that. I thought it was 100 million people. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I was just I was just asking. Um, so you think that maybe we can get towards having everyone vaccinated by call it that wants a vaccine, because clearly not everyone's going to want a vaccine either. Um, so maybe around June or July or what is your estimate for that? Or I realize you're not this is not your particular area of expertise, but what's your I'm just this is what I think about all the time. And I just I just would really want to know. Yeah, so um, I think this stuff is so important, and I'm I'm so willing to opine on issues I have little expertise in. But this stuff is so important that I just want to put in big fine print. I'm not a domain <laughs> expert here, and uh, what I would what I would offer though is that the tailwind of a full throated capitalist response and private sector being leveraged and coordinated. Our, our superpower as a species is cooperation. There not mm -hmm. only hasn't been any, there's more cross-border cooperation to build a Nissan right now than there has been with respect to coordinating a COVID-19 response. And there's not even intrastate coordination. The, the, the protocols for who gets vaccinated in Florida are much different than they are in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lack of communication, a lack of sharing of infrastructure and supplies, and hopefully that's changing. Hopefully the connective tissue of a federal government response and the horsepower of our private sector. I mean, let me let me say something more provocative here. I think we would have had an entirely different response if Amazon, Google, and Apple and the Nasdaq stock had been cut in half versus accelerate six to eighty percent. I think the dirty secret of COVID nineteen is the following, and that is the top ten percent, which largely control the government. Uh, Four hundred families make up fifty percent of the donations to the presidential election, and they speedball that influence with think tanks and PACs and media, which is owned by a small half, handful of families. Um, I think the dirty secret is, and I'm part of this group, we're living our best lives. And we don't like to say that out loud. But for most of us who are healthy, COVID-19 has meant more time with family, more time with Netflix, and you've never been wealthier. There's been an explosion in wealth among the top 10%. So that's not to say that wealthy people who are healthy uh, aren't worried about the pandemic. That's not to say that they're complicit in it. That's not to say that they're in any way rooting for it. But when your life is 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 gotten better, it doesn't inspire the type of full-throated response that was required here. And I think, unfortunately, mm. the outcomes of the pandemic for the people who would be most responsible, I think if Apple stock had declined 60% instead of going up 60%, I think if the NASDAQ had been cut in half, our response would have made the response in Taiwan and Singapore look like amateur hour. Uh, we don't have a collective sense of uh, shared pain here. And the result, in my opinion, has unwittingly been disastrous. Well, speaking of big tech, a lot of your book is about big tech. And let's just get started with a very specific question. Should, they, should Twitter ban Trump? Yeah, but they should have done it 14 days, not 1,449 days into, into um, his 1,460-day tenure. The, the big lie from big tech has been really two lies around supporting, using their uh, algorithms of amplification to spread misinformation. Uh, first is they try and turn it into a free speech or a First Amendment issue, which is total bullshit. The First Amendment states that Congress will write no law that inhibits speech. These are private companies they have absolutely no obligation to the First Amendment, and there's nothing in the background of the people running big tech firms that would indicate they have any affinity or reverence for the First Amendment. I used to go on CNBC every Wednesday morning. I hauled my butt down to the New York Stock Exchange for five years, and then one Wednesday they said, oh, we're going with another story, and then they never returned my calls again, and I was effectively soft banned from CNBC. 
Is that censorship? It happened about the time I started getting very aggressive around big tech. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I just sucked, but it's their right. They decided what was best for shareholder value, the nation, whatever, was not to have me on their platform. And that's their right. The most frightening the most frightening thing about the second lie was that we have all bought into this notion that it would be impossible to moderate these platforms, billions of pieces of content. And we've also found out that was a lie, that within 48 hours of banning the Trump, Trump's account, 72% of misinformation around our election went away. I, I think just personally, we can all agree, or most of us would agree, the internet has just become a softer, gentler, most, more pleasant place just since the president's account was removed. There are supposedly 27 accounts, just 27 accounts that were responsible for three quarters of the misinformation that could possibly lead to insurrection. So in some, in some, and I want to move to what we need to do. I don't think this is a time for the nation to reunite and come together. When you hear a CEO talking, that, saying we're all in this together, it's usually a CEO looking for a government bailout after he or she has said, embrace rugged individualism on the way up and use their excess cash flow to buy back stock to juice their own compensation. When you hear a senator saying we need to come together and reunite, it's usually a senator who's, in my opinion, complicit in sedition. This is not a time to reunite. The key to, the key to unity here is accountability. And I believe the CEOs and boards of these companies that have ignored uh, this misinformation and slow rolled it, uh, and as a result, have lent uh, the inflammatory uh, have created inflammation and dramatic uh, uh, overreach of this content, inciting mobs, literally inciting mobs, and then providing the infrastructure for them to organize. I believe that they need to be held accountable. I just don't think there's any getting around it. The role that these platforms played in our representatives, and keep in mind, these are representatives, each of them I mean, I was really, I don't know, about, I don't know about you, Howard. I was very rattled by the, the events of 15 days ago when I saw our 455 representatives who is responsible for representing uh, uh, 755,000 of us. That means that each of us was lying on the floor in terror with a mask on and, and barricading the doors with furniture for fear that the vice president and the speaker were going to be uh, apprehended and executed. Uh, and these these platforms played a role in it. I have no doubt that the mob, most of the mob will be held accountable. Uh, my fear is that none of the elites that leverage the mob through their platforms or ignoring the misinformation will be held accountable. I wanna be clear, I don't think that the leadership and board of Facebook and Twitter wanted a mob to overrun the government, but there's a there's data showing that when someone gets a DUI, they've usually on average driven drunk 200 times before they get the DUI. So yeah, maybe you didn't mean to kill that family in the minivan, but you have made reckless choices and you are culpable. And I think that's probably an apt analogy for the management and directors of Facebook and Google who have been driving drunk and have uh, be, been behaving recklessly. And again, the shocking thing here was it wasn't nearly as difficult to fix as they claimed it was. Just had to ban a couple of accounts. It wasn't even like you needed AI to be fact checking based off of source. You literally cut the head off the snake. That's what it, I mean, you're, you're in this business. You, you're going to forget more about search and algorithms than I'm ever going to know. Where, where do I have this wrong? Well, I think user generated content is kind of the issue here. Used to be that anytime content was going to make it out into the world, it would come from someone authoritative and there'd be editors involved and it would go over the newspaper or go over a TV station. There'd be people looking at this and fact checking and the brand of the institution had credibility that people would tune in to watch ABC news or CBS news or whatever news people would watch New York times. I think you were on the board of, and now anybody with a pen, sorry, anybody with a, with a connection to the internet can use their pen to write whatever they want and say whatever they want. And I think there's a lot of nuance when you get towards being able to let people say whatever they want, but you can do it anonymously sometimes too. So I, you wonder who on Twitter, yes, you have the, first off, this is a, a strange situation because you have the president of the United States, you know, are you supposed to, if you're Facebook or Twitter, block their account? I think that's kind of a 
unprecedented. You're out in a territory where there's no historical precedent for how to deal with that. If this right. was not the president elected, by the way, by 65, I don't remember what the, how many votes he got the first time, but 60, 70 million votes, there's a lot of people that voted and put him into the office and he legitimately won the first election. So I think it's a, it's a challenging kind of thing, but the problem is, is user generated content, especially anonymous user generated content. When people can say whatever they want anonymously, it just turns into a nasty free for all. And I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't be able to say whatever they want. The problem is when you did it in the town square back in the medieval times, everyone knew that was Scott that said that mean thing. And now you can hide behind a mask quite literally and say whatever you want. So user generated content, I think, is the, the issue at play here. But then you have, you know, I look at companies like Cloudflare. They'll, they're in some ways the last line of resort in blocking what might be up or live because they can block DOS attacks. And, and so big tech, I guess my question is, what role should big tech play in regulating content? So uh, and how, look, how do they I, stop? How do you stop the next QAnon? It's more of a grassroots thing, too. Well, one, I'd like to think that we should call on their better angels and that individuals who have been so blessed with the assets and the infrastructure and the freedoms of our, and, and the capitalist society, that they would show more regard for the Commonwealth. That has not happened. I think they see themselves as some weird fucked up version of global citizens and have talked themselves into believing that, oh, I'm about a First Amendment person because if I can just let anti-vax content rage, novelty and lies are much more interesting. And this didn't start on social media. Fox figured this out early. They said, OK, if we really throw incendiary out, maybe it's true. People close to the issue say that Nancy Pelosi is linked to Dominion voting machines, right? Okay, that's an outrageous statement, it's false, but it gets a lot of attention and it results in more enragement equals engagement, which equals more Nissan ads. So Fox figured out that rather than having the typical news used to be, news used to lose money, but broadcast stations said, we're making so much money running commercials on happy days that we have a civic obligation to run the news 30 minutes a night. And 97% of it was truth, fact checked, and 3% of it was novelty. And remember at the end, you're, you're younger than me, but at the end they used to have point counterpoint. And Saturday Night Live yeah. did a great job and kind of summarized it where Dan Aykroyd would say to Jane Curtin, Jane, you ignorant slut. But that was meant to be the last three minutes of news. And then yeah. Fox figured out if you flip novelty to 97% of the content or misinformation and you take truth down to 3%, truth is boring. Truth is expensive and boring and not that exciting. And if you move it to opinion and novelty, people engage, they want to come in, they find it entertaining and you make more money. And then quite frankly, CNN and NBC did the same thing on the other side. And then so they create they create a lie they create or misinformation or exaggeration or inflammatory content and then social media runs with it yep. and there's a few key accounts that start the nuclear kind of blast zone and then other bad actors weigh in anonymous accounts and start amplifying and pouring gasoline on it the head of the communications um propaganda uh, department for the KGB wrote a, wrote a book saying, this is how you bring down America. And he outlined it perfectly. Uh, you create stories by virtue of stories existing on these new interactive platforms, they gain legitimacy and you create stories and then we weigh in and just pour fire on them. And he said what he, what he didn't realize is he thought they would have to create the propaganda. And he said, no, now the US is creating their own propaganda. We just need to occasionally weigh in and amplified. And I, I realize what I'm about to say sounds paranoid, but it doesn't mean I'm wrong. If I ever am critical of Russia, if I am ever critical of China, a bunch of people, including moms with a picture of them and their basset hound on a soccer field, weigh in and with the same language and say, Scott, love your work, but your hysteria over China or Russia damages your credibility. And then if I click on that person's profile, I find that they have 40 or 50 followers. And I can't find out that they, and I find out they don't exist. Now, if I, working, if I were working for the intelligence group of the Russian uh, government, and I realized I could not go toe to toe with America on aircraft carriers or tanks, 
I would, I would say I'm going to take $100 million and I'm going to create troll farms that do nothing but identify the 10,000 most influential people in America on Twitter and on these social media platforms. And if they're anti-Russian, I'm slowly but surely going to weigh in and try and diminish their, diminish their credibility. And that person and with 70 followers gets to show up in your feed. So uh, the sad part is I think these organizations know exactly what's been going on. But unfortunately, they've created an ad model that profits from this type of misinformation and this type of incendiary comment that tears, that tears at the fabric of our society. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we've created or they've created a business model with algorithms that are indifferent to our the well-being of our economy that immediately realize that anti-vax uh, speech deserves to be heard. It was a small number of people talking about this stuff, but it became so incendiary and created so much commentary that the algorithms of Facebook and Twitter say, we love this content. It's good for us. We can serve more Chobani ads. So they started promoting it and giving it more oxygen. And by virtue of people getting more and more content in their feeds on anti-vax, it, it granted it legitimacy. And the result is we have, for the first time, outbreaks of measles that we've never had before. 14% of black Americans don't trust this vaccine. The most vulnerable population in COVID is overweight people of color. And in some demographic groups, 86% of them don't trust the vaccine. I mean, this is, we're talking about death, disease, and disability here because content, and no one's denying people's, people's right to talk about that content, but because these platforms have trafficked in the amplification of this content, we have mistaken freedom of speech for freedom of reach. And these companies, uh, 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 Fox to a lesser extent, CNN and NBC, uh, but really the, the, the fuel on these flames has been social media platforms and their algorithms. They're not doing anything different than Fox and CNN are doing. They're just doing it at scale. Uh, so you have three to eight million people on a good night watching Fox. Facebook reaches a billion people every week. So. It's well, one Twitter, is a dump people, Twitter lets people sign up anonymously. And that's that Russian account that you saw. That's who is that? Where's the authentication from that? Who who are these people? Who are these accounts? These algorithms uh, identity, are amplified. Identity is huge. And I've always said we should have identity. On LinkedIn, you have an identity. Um, and when you said to your point in the town square, you have an identity. Even people I know, I have venture capitalists. I'm sometimes critical of a private company. I say it's overvalued. That in the world of venture capital is a crime against humanity if it's in their portfolio. And they weigh in and they say these just incredibly venomous things that they would never say in person. They would never even say it in an op-ed in the FT. They would never use that kind of language or make those sort of personal attacks. So there's something about these platforms that is exceptionally harmful, not only to the discourse, and then, and then they back up, and New, the New York Times will support them on this bullshit argument, but what about the female journalist in Yemen that needs safety and anonymity? Okay, fine. We can probably figure out a way to get her an anonymous Twitter account without allowing millions of fake bots to weigh in and do nothing but try and bring oxygen to misinformation to tear at the fabric of our society. There is such a weird absolutist uh, screwed up version of wokeness around freedom of speech and both sidedness and all this stuff. This is a huge problem. I don't think we come together around this stuff until we hold the management of these platforms um, accountable. I think what has gone on here is uh, absolutely, absolutely outrageous. I think there was a thin there. I think there was a direct correlation between what these algorithms have been trained to do by people with capitalist motives and a Capitol Police officer being bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher. I think there is a direct line of accountability. So it's gotta be more than the mob that's, that's accountable here. It has to be the elites. Hannah Aaron, the political philosopher of the 20th century has a great quote, and that is fascism, fascism is the temporary alliance between the elites and the mob. We've had a mob and we've had an el elites try and make money off of them. And I think both need to be held accountable. Well, let's talk about the uh, algorithms, not just in social, but in search. Google. Well, first off, do you use DuckDuckGo or Google? What do you use to search? 
I'm lazy. I use I use Google occasionally. I get all hopped up and I use Bing, but I don't use DuckDuckGo. Um, I should, um, but I'm I'm like most consumers. I talk a big game, and then I want that little black dress for nine ninety nine, which means there's probably child labor somewhere in that supply chain. I don't think. I think it's a bad strategy to wait for consumers to do the right thing. I think government needs to weigh in and regulate. So I, that's a that's a rationalization for basically saying uh, uh, no. I use Google, and I know I probably shouldn't. I'd what do you use? Day, I use all kinds of stuff. I'll use Alexa. I'll use. I mean, think of the think of search in every application that you use. If you have an Alexa, if you use Siri, when you I use I do use Google, I use Bing, I use DuckDuckGo, but often I'm using a site search on a company's website and running a search there and getting an answer. And you know, one of the things in your book that I loved, and let's just turn to the book for a minute, is your ideas for new business models. And you specifically mentioned Kara would be willing to pay maybe some amount per month. I think it was maybe $2,000 a month because she has how many followers? A couple hundred thousand, half a million, something like that. A model one whereby a one and a half million. Okay. Shows how often I, I, I only follow like 20 people on Twitter. So yeah. uh, you, you included. So she's a million and a half followers. So you charge her a subscription to use a term that you used a rundle uh, to, uh, to pay for access to tweet. Do you think that would work for Instagram? Because I was thinking for Instagram that it's the creators who create content and and that Facebook is pretty good at selling ads and the ads work pretty well, unlike Twitter. And maybe the model for Facebook that could be a little bit different would be to split revenues with creators somehow. And then just the next question here I have for you on that is take a look at Google's search results. Over the last 10 years, they've become, they used to be blue and yellow on the right rail. And there'd be ads on the side. Those don't exist anymore. And then the color of the ad has gotten whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter. And now it looks pretty much the same. And now, by the way, they used to have a max of two at the top, then three, they have four. Are they just going to turn into overture and just blend the organic and ad results? How do you see that playing out? I think they're already there. I'll I'll go in reverse order. Google used to be about, we're going to take you to the best place we know of based on your query. And in exchange for that, we're going to run two ads at the top and we're going to be transparent that these are ads. Now they don't take you to the best place. They take you to another place they can further monetize. And basically the entire front, front page for a lot of searches is basically one big ad for Google. And they've got an incredible business, uh, good for them. It's still incredibly utile. Uh, but yeah, I think they're already there. Uh, the, and slowly but surely, they've deprioritized Wikipedia because they found people are going to Wikipedia more than their sites they can monetize. So they deprioritize Wikipedia. I mean, this is a company that can literally put other people out of business just with a tweak in their algorithm. When I was on the board of the New York Times company, we owned a company called about.com that would create very search friendly content. And then we'd run ads on our site. And in one night with whatever they called it, a panda, our revenues declined 60%. I mean, they basically put us out of business overnight. So uh, now back to your uh, back to your point on the majority of my research, uh, you know, and I'm going to name drop whether I'm advising Walmart, LVMH, Best Buy, or Chanel. I'm kind of a one trick pony, and that is the most accretive action uh, in the history of business has happened over the last 10 years, and it's the same action, and that is moving your business from a transactional business, retail. All right, you come, somebody comes in and they buy a, a dress, and then you have to get them back in the store the next day uh, versus recurring revenue, SaaS, syndicated research, Netflix. Uh, the moment you transition from a transactional business to a recurring revenue business, your company gets recast and the multiple on earnings or revenues skyrockets. So Apple has not added any meaningful top line to the revenue over the last 18 months. Their earnings have really not grown, but they've gone from 10% of revenue being recurring to 24%. And so the market has taken them from a P of 14 to 38. 
the highest multiple firms, the most valuable firms in the world as a function of their multiple on revenues have all one thing in common, and that is recurring revenue. And it taps into a basic flaw in our species. And that is, we are terrible with a proportion of time. And that is, we, we think, uh, I joined Equinox, 250 bucks a month, I work out three times a week, 12 times, 20 bucks to go hang out with people better looking than me wearing Lululemon. Worth it. Totally worth it. No problem. No, I don't. I travel all the time. I make excuses not to work out. I go to Equinox four times, maybe three times a month. I'm paying 80 bucks. Is that worth it? But they know the flaw in the species. You always want to attach your business to the flaw in the species, and that is we misestimate how fast time goes. You're a young man. Yesterday I was graduating from college and I blinked and now I'm I'm technically a senior citizen according to the AARP. I mean it, it just you want to take advantage of that flaw. In addition, when you go to recurring revenue, you start investing more in the relationship and thinking about product mm -hmm. development, you can better plan your capital expenditures as opposed to constantly putting on a red dress and blow drying your hair and standing at the front of your store and saying, "Hey, come in, come in." It's a superior business model. It's more predictable. It's been the greatest accretion of shareholder value over the last 10 years when companies move, whether it's Adobe, uh, when they move to kind of a recurring revenue membership model. Companies with that monogamous relationship with their consumer traded a multiple of revenues. Companies that have that transactional business model traded a multiple of um, EBITDA. And people say, yeah. well, it's I, I'm a, I, sell, I sell bikes. I'm not going to get into a recurring revenue relationship. I'm like, Okay, but is there some sort of service or community or ongoing repair where you charge them 10 bucks a month? If you can just get to one, two, if the fastest part of your business can be, growing part of your business can be some sort of recurring revenue business, you begin thinking differently. You begin planning capital differently. You begin thinking about the relationship with the customer over the long term because it's a one-year contract as opposed to a transactional relationship. So I think every business, every CEO in every sector needs to think, Okay, I'm the head of Charity Water, a nonprofit that brings potable water to Africa. Scott, Scott Harrison, who is a visionary, says, all right, I, I would rather you give me $10 a month than give me $1,000. Commit to giving me $10 a month or 25 bucks a month because it changes the relationship. We're in, we're in a monogamous relationship and everything goes down to biology. The households that build wealth typically have one thing in common. They're in a monogamous relationship with someone. Being single is expensive. It involves alcohol, trips to St. Bart's, and spending money on stupid shit. And it is hard, and it's the same way in business. You want to enter into a monogamous relation with your customer set. I think it's a really great point. And, you know, there's another dynamic when I was reading the book and you were talking about the recurring revenue rundle, if you will, that occurred to me with regard to a sales approach. So when you have a you can remove the pain of purchasing instead of Equinox charging $80 a visit, which no one would pay. People incorrectly estimate how many visits they will make and therefore end up overestimating the value of the subscription while undermining the time. The, the other interesting thing is that a bundle gives the big companies that have already won an enormous go-to-market advantage against upstarts. And for example, let's take a look at what Microsoft did with Teams, where they just versus Slack, where, well, gosh, we have how many customers already on Office 365 and they're already paying? We're literally just going to roll Teams in for free. Now, if you're a CIO of a company and you're making a purchasing decision of Slack versus Teams, by the way, Slack is a way better product. But Teams is free. It's part of Office. And so, gosh, it's hard to justify going with something that would cost the business more money when you can get something through the Microsoft rundle, if you will, the Office rundle for free already. So I think, but then another thing happens too, which is that, and this just got me thinking, does big tech end up looking a lot like, and by the way, I think that is what forced Slack to sell to Salesforce because they had to pretty much partner up with one of the behemoths in order yeah. to have, have, have the ability to go out there and win. And so that got me thinking, does big tech just kind of end up a lot like auto where there's five companies and they all make the same car and 
yeah, there's Tesla, but take them aside for a second. And a BMW 3 looks a lot like an Audi 3, which looks a lot like a Mercedes 3. And you have essentially in big tech feature parity. And so maybe you have Adobe and Oracle and Microsoft in SaaS at least, and they all have search and chat and CRM and database. Do you think that Rundle's, well, a superior business approach may kill differentiation? So a lot to unpack there. Let me be clear. I think the fastest way, if you're thinking about shareholder value or stakeholder value, I think the move to from a transactional to recurring revenue bundle, if you will, is the way to go. And the most successful consumer bundle in history or Rundle is Amazon Prime. 83% of US households have a monogamous relationship with Prime. The most successful B2B bundle, you reference Microsoft Office. And then you can start just layering things in, charge make it free and boom, it only has to be seven or 80% of the leader. You know, this is what Microsoft initially did with uh, Internet Explorer, right? And put the fastest growing company in history to date, Netscape out of business in basically six months. And so there's an antitrust issue. And that is one of the most oxygenating things we could do for the economy right now would be to go in across not only just big tech, but big pharma, big ag, big food, and deconcentrate power. It, it, there are two or three companies in every industry that used to have 30% market share, 40%, now they have 70 or 80. It has become very difficult for the little guy to get any oxygen. So I'm a fan of going in and breaking up guys. Uh, uh, Apple TV Plus, mediocre content, but I've watched Greyhound, I watch the morning show because I can get to, I can get to the morning show on this in three clicks. Apple TV mm. Plus comes preloaded on my phone. I click on it. It doesn't ask me for my credit card. I click on I click on TV. I see the morning show. I click on it, and it's playing. For me to get to Bridgerton, or for me, let me pick something better. For me to get to the Queen's Gambit on Netflix, and I, you know, I've done this. Seventeen clicks on this. So mm. you're going to watch B plus content that's three clicks over A minus content that's seventeen. So owning the rails and the bundle and the economic power. And when I talk about moving to a rundle, well, it sounds good in theory, but just as, you know, just as if you're going to put a ring on it or, or take a ring, you've really got to be into the other person. When you ask somebody to enter into a recurring revenue relationship, the offering has to be staggering. It has to be really, really strong. Most rundles that work have one thing in common. They're not consumer choices, they're IQ tests. Amazon Prime isn't a choice, it's an IQ test. Netflix isn't a choice, it's an IQ test. You get, you get what do you get with it? Uh, for every dollar you spend on Netflix per month, you get $2 mm -hmm. billion dollars in content. I mean, that's just an amazing deal. For 12 bucks, they'll give me $24 billion in content. Right. A dollar a month for $2 billion in content. And that's why Quibi never had a chance. They were spending, they said to us, okay, we'll give you, we'll, we want $5 for every billion dollars in content we give you. So it's not easy. The offering has to be dramatic, which is Latin for you're going to have to raise a shit ton of capital and have the investors and board to stomach dramatic losses. So whenever I come into boards, I say, we want to move to Arundel. I'm like, okay, are you prepared to go from 28 points of EBITDA to negative 30 for the next two to three years? Because consumers, you know, you're not going to just marry anybody. You're going to have to look at that person and say, wow, that's worth giving up all the rest for. So it's incredibly expensive. It lends itself to big players. It lends itself to people who already have a bundle. And we absolutely uh, need to oxygenate the marketplace and go in and break up the biggest players across every industry. But I've never seen anything. I think the reason that Apple will probably get to $200 a share in the next 24 months is because right now they have a rundle that's arcade, Apple TV Plus, Apple News. Pretty soon they're going to roll this in. They're going to say, okay, Scott, you're, you're fairly price insensitive. You want the latest and greatest iPhone, the greatest AirPods, AirPod Max. I want those new cans. You want the latest iPad. We'll send you our latest products 60 days before anybody else, preloaded. We know what you want. It just gets to your house. We don't ask you. And it's 50, 70, 100, 120 bucks a month. And the billion wealthiest people in the world, known as iOS users, if 5% of them, 50 million of them say, yeah, I'm all in, 
don't abuse it. Don't send me shit I don't want. Don't overcharge me. But if I get I, the new cans from Apple, I went to go buy them. They're not out till April. I mean, my God, I spent so much money on Apple. You think Apple would have just sent them to me and said, we know you love Apple. We know you're going to love this. And Sheena Angar, uh, a professor of marketing at Columbia, who is sort of the top scholar on the world of choice, has this fantastic saying that literally reframed the way I think about marketing. And she said that one of the greatest fallacies or mistakes we make as marketers is believing that choice is a good thing. It's not. Choice is a tax. We don't want more choice. We want to be more confident in the choices presented. And that's what bundles are. Bundles say, okay, we're going to edit this for you. We don't have 20 iPads. We have the right two or three. We don't have 100 toasters. We have the right two or three. We're William Sonoma. So that bundle that gives you confidence uh, and is so dramatic and is such a great offering that you immediately go in. Uh, is an incredibly expensive and incredibly difficult. And if you can pull it off, incredibly lucrative. But to your point, it favors the big, as has everything in the last 30 years. Well, it's interesting that Google search is not a bundle. It's not a bundle. I mean, they certainly have recurring revenue stream products with their apps and their enterprise services, but that's the ad model with Facebook and with Google, where they're charging, where you are the product, where they charge for access to you and what you know what we're trying to do at Yext of course is move search to a rundle and say hey companies you're spending a ton of money on Google ads but it turns out if you offer your own Google on your own website with answers about you facts about you you pay for the software you pay Yext for software or someone else for software to do that but you can answer the questions just as well as Google can and so there's a rundle opportunity, I think, in search. In addition to the rundle opportunity that you saw in Twitter, where I think it would be incredibly bold for them to move uh, to that kind of model. So I have a question for you. What is a Benjamin Button product? So that's my way, my fancy way of, of trying to brand uh, network effects. And, but it's got another nuance to it. So network effects are, all right, the reason why Facebook is so powerful is that everybody's already on it. And the reason why uh, two fax machines is infinitely more valuable than one is as more people have fax machines, you get network effects. And what Benjamin Button is, is it says, okay, not only are there network effects, but every time I, an additional user turns on Waze, their ping, their ping to the satellite that shows how long it's taking them to get on the LIE to uh, LaGuardia, informs the algorithm such that they can update and calibrate it more finely for other people about to start the same journey and say, no, it's not going to take you 37 minutes. It's going to take you 39 because we now have 100 people on their way to LaGuardia and we can register and calibrate how long it's going to take. And that is, first up, so it's just, just the, the reasoning behind the name. It's the short story by um, F. Scott Fitzgerald about a father who's heartbroken because he loses his son in war. So he builds a clock that goes backwards, thinking maybe he can turn back time and bring back his son. And it's a story, uh, it turned into a movie with Brad Pitt, a guy who's born old and ages in reverse and dies as a baby. So the, the real gangster move uh, across product development is to figure out a way to build in some sort of feature where the product gets better when other people use it. The majority of consumer tech icons, excuse me, the majority of economic uh, icons through the 20th century, their products age biologically. The moment you drove a Chrysler LeBaron yep. off the lot, it lost 25% of its value. That moment, yep. when you twist a cap off Colgate, it probably loses 97% of its value. No one's gonna buy a, a used toothpaste. But these products, whether it's Amazon through customer reviews, whether it's Waze, whether it's Facebook, as the feed gets more robust, uh, Twitter has those Benjamin Button effects. How do you build in some sort of community or networking component such that the more people use this product, the more valuable it ages in reverse? And I found that if you look at the companies, so for example, Netflix ages in reverse because when they find guys like me when they start registering the kind of content they like, they figure out, all right, Scott, his favorite actor is Hitler. He'll watch anything starring Hitler. And the recommendation figures out who I am faster. 
and start saying, oh, guys like Scott that are obsessed with World War II and are mildly depressed and angry, not only like this stuff, they like this. And that my home screen, I always thought, I say to young people when they're dating someone, if you want to know someone, ask for their, to see their Netflix home screen. Uh, but the, every additional person that watches Netflix informs the algorithm and makes the service better for other people. The same is true of Spotify. So it's more than just scale or network effects. It's network effects that result in a reverse aging of the product. Long-winded, long-winded answer, Howard. Got it. All right. Well, it is around 145 and we have some questions. And I have the questions right here. So we have a question from Adam Freed at Waze. What does everyone else have wrong about 2021? Do you know Adam? Is that why you're laughing? <laughs> no, I just Waze. Uh, uh, we were just talking about Waze. What does everyone? What does everyone have wrong about 2021? Um, look, I think I'm, I think the markets are going to surge. Um, uh, you have, okay, so you have, do you own any Bitcoin? Uh, no, I wish I did. And I keep, I keep planning to buy some, uh, but I'm, one of my many flaws is, is, is as an investor is I never can buy anything at the price it's at. I always want it. I was like, I first started seriously looking at Bitcoin when it was at 5,000. I said, I'll wait till it goes to a thousand. Then just a f six months ago, I was looking at a 12,000. I thought once it gets below 10, I'll buy it. Shot to 19, I thought, well, I'll wait till it goes back to 12, and now it's at, you know, whatever, 35. Uh, the reason why you want to buy some Bitcoin is just so you don't hate yourself if it goes to a million dollars. And I don't understand this. I don't think the market understands it. And I think there's a chance, a non-zero probability that Bitcoin could go to a million dollars. And who knows, maybe it's the Wizard of Oz and a bunch of people uh, uh, manipulating it. But I think just for your own sanity, you want to own a little in case it does go just apeshit crazy. And also, there seems to be a correlation between people getting out of gold funds and Bitcoin going up. It's hard to transport a million dollars of gold overseas or divide it. Anyways, that's um, uh, uh, that's Bitcoin. What do we get wrong about 2021? I think the markets are going to surge, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons. And that is, uh, if you look at the stimulus, um, so about $5 trillion, about $1 trillion of it, uh, extended unemployment insurance, um, uh, additional uh, 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 stimulus for people in need. That's a trillion of it. We need to protect our brothers and sisters. Two to three trillion of it has gone to small business bailouts, uh, forgivable loans, and the bailouts of companies like Delta Airlines. Uh, effectively, what you have is, if you look at total compensation across America, total compensation, net compensation is decreased by $50 billion because a lot of people have gotten raises. Now, that masks the pain because the majority of the people who've lost their jobs have been impacted, weren't making that much money to begin with. So that number is misleading. But we put a trillion dollars of stimulus out into the marketplace. In addition, consumers have saved in aggregate $500 billion because they're not going to Disneyland or the Olive Garden. So you have one and a half trillion dollars in additional uh, cash sitting in households, and you have people who are jonesing jonesing to get out of the house. We are all so long family. We are all so sick of sitting in our homes that the moment we get something resembling an all clear here, you're going to see the consumer economy just rip upward. Now, unfortunately, I would argue that we have basically borrowed money from the unborn's credit card and young people uh, to basically America used to be about how do you get people rich? Now I think America is about how do we keep the rich rich? And that is we talk about saving restaurants. Let them go out of business. And you know what happens when a restaurant goes out of business? The rent goes down, the inputs go down, and some 27-year-old who just got out of a culinary academy comes in and is able to start their own restaurant that, by the way, is better prepared for the new economy. You can't have capitalism unless you let the forces of creative destruction blow. I've had businesses go out of business and it's disappointing, but it's not profound. So we have to let we have to let businesses go out of business. We have bailed out rich people, the wealthiest cohort in America, small business owners. Like the millionaire next door owns three car washes and we've decided that we need to protect small businesses. We have this idolatry of entrepreneurs that is unhealthy. So effectively what we've done is is we have borrowed money against future mm -hmm. generations 
and not provided the creative destruction to young people. The reason I live the way I get to live now is because in 2009, I was able to buy Apple stock for 10 bucks a share because of the crisis. As I was coming into my prime earning income years, the market crashed and I was able to swoop in and buy some shit. If Brooklyn real estate goes down to a thousand bucks a foot from 1500, if people get to buy Amazon at 50 times earning instead of 500, that's bad for old rich people, but it's good for young, not rich yet people. So we have effectively decided our collective, our collective goal is to use the pandemic as cloud cover to keep the rich rich or maybe make them richer at the expense of younger people and at the expense of future generations. We have played this pandemic like a Stradivarius. The shareholder class has absolutely seen their wealth skyrocket and future generations are gonna have to pay it back. But he, anyways, the question is what do we, what do not people not saying about 2021? The markets are gonna skyrocket and we're gonna find that competence matters. And I think we're gonna see, I'd like to think we're gonna see uh, uh, more unification across America. Uh, and we're gonna see consumer stocks, cyclicals uh, rip up. All right, the next question is from Daniel Fell at Optum, a large healthcare company. And so the question is about healthcare, which you touch on in the book. By the way, healthcare insurance is kind of a rundle, I guess. Um, and so here's his question. With the retreat of initiatives like Haven, how much can or do companies like Amazon really disrupt healthcare in the next 24 months? Okay, so first off, let's dispel a myth that Maven, Maven's closure means anything. It doesn't. This was a press release from Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, and Amazon. They're buddies, they like each other, and said we should really do something around healthcare. They all have different priorities around healthcare. The total staff at Maven was 60 people. Amazon hires 60 people every 45 minutes. Amazon mm -hmm. is absolutely going very big into healthcare, not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to. When you are a company, for Amazon to maintain the velocity of their stock, they have to add about a quarter of a trillion dollars to their top line in the next five years, which means they have to go big game hunting, that you can't feed a city hunting squirrels. So there are maybe 10 industries they could go into that have a carcass big enough for them to attack to sate the appetite of top line growth they need. They could go into the automobile industry. Unfortunately, it's a shitty low margin business that's actually fairly efficiently run. All paths lead to the same place when you're talking about top line revenue growth that is high margin, where prices have increased, yet outcomes and satisfaction are either flat or decreased. And that is one place, healthcare. A distance number two, uh, uh, but still a huge industry is, is education. But healthcare, 17% of GDP in the US economy, arguably the largest industry in the world. And every year they raise prices faster than inflation and every year life expectancy does not go up and for mortality does not decline and people do not love their healthcare. So you are about to see Amazon in a big, big way continue its, um, it's, it's uh, for a, into healthcare. I believe that Amazon will soon be vaccinating us, testing our blood, managing our healthcare. Amazon knows your body mass index. It knows if you're in a monogamous relationship. It knows the food you order. It knows your zip code, your demographics. It can surround you and create a digital corpus of your health and start uh, going on the offense and treating your lifestyle and your diet as opposed to treating diseases. It can actually play offense instead of defense. I think at some point you're gonna come home and Alexa's gonna say, would you like to cut your health insurance costs by up to 50%? Say, Amazon, tell me about prime healthcare insurance. I think they're gonna go in the insurance business, the diagnostics business, all through prime. I think it's gonna be enormous. If I were just coming out of college and was an economic animal and said, okay, I just wanna go into an industry where there's going to be just tremendous stakeholder creation, value creation. I think health tech and ad tech are the place to, places to be. Healthcare is about to make uh, to crown seven hundred several hundred new billionaires. It's going to be the most exciting place in business over the next decade. As long as Amazon continues to send me the pizza bagels I order without judging me for that, I will be happy. I will be. I hope they're investing in their cold supply chain right now too. Uh, so one more question, and then I have a final question for you, Scott. So this question is from Stefan 
Butelsbacher, I think dialed in from Germany. And I think he is with Die Welt, which I know is like the Time magazine yeah. of Germany. Great job. And so here is the question. And it's in English, fortunately, not German. Since the onset of the pandemic, major companies like HP and Oracle have begun moving out of the Bay Area. Can you talk about the future of Silicon Valley? And are we witnessing the end of America, uh, the end of Silicon Valley is, uh, as America's most important innovation hub? And I want to add one thing to that. Can you add your thoughts on remote work and the future of remote work to your answer to this question? Okay, so what we're seeing here, the largest trend and the largest wealth creation trend trends of the last 50 years have been first and foremost globalization, the second was digitization, and I think the third we're in the midst of, and that is dispersion. And loosely speaking, it's taking the core value of a product or a service and moving beyond traditional modes of friction or distribution to add more value in a more seamless way. The most recent example is I got to watch Wonder Woman 1984. I always thought, why on earth can I not watch Star Wars in my favorite theater, which is my living room? I'll pay 50 or 100 bucks to see it the day it comes out in theaters. And ultimately, the consumer wins. Content is being dispersed. I now have the entire music industry on an app on my phone. It's been dispersed away from Virgin Records and albums that charge me 15 bucks for the two songs I want. It's been dispersed to this. Healthcare is skipping hospitals and doctor's offices. 99% of the people who contracted, endured, and developed the antibodies from the novel coronavirus will have never stepped in a doctor's office, much less a hospital. So dispersion, if you will, is kind of the is kind of the you know absolutely the enormous um, uh, uh, value creator here. What was his question? I got so caught up in my own bullshit, I forgot his question. Whether Silicon Valley is oh going Silicon to Valley sort of dispersion of HQ. So Zoom has built has built a business worth more than Telefonica or Orange or Vodafone on the dispersion of HQ to homes. That is huge. Yep. So let's talk about dispersion of HQ. <laughs> He's senile, but occasionally he says something insightful. Anyways, you have, you're going to see a destruction of 20 to 30% of the time spent in headquarters. My first job at Morgan Stanley, 1251 Avenue of the Americas, averages 8,500 people a day pre-pandemic. It's now averaging 500. It might go back to three or 4,000. It's not going back to 8,500. So if you see a, a net gross demand of 20 to 30 percent time spent in commercial real estate that's a 12 trillion dollar industry that's going to flow and be dispersed to the home so stocks like restoration hardware and sonos are going to rip lumber prices pulte homes home builders are going to rip all of a sudden that carpet that you noticed was ratty is now intolerable mm. uh, hq is being dispersed to our homes in terms of cities the rumors of death of cities is greatly exaggerated Young people, the most talented people in the world have one thing in common. Uh, they want to be in cities. And there's very few 24 year old women with double E's from MIT that say, you know what? We'd really like to hire you and have you come spend two to five years in London or New York. No, I want to stay. I want to stay in Des Moines, says none of them, unless they have to or they have families. The most talented people aggregate around cities. It's the most interesting density of culture and ideas need to have sex and bounce off of each other. Uh, so cities are going to continue, I think, to boom. Now, it's situational, mm. though. A city like San Francisco is tantamount to healthcare, and that is it is expensive yet bad. It's just simply put, priced itself well beyond the value. San Francisco is a poorly governed, poorly managed city with a poor, you know, an increasingly poor quality of life that's also the most expensive city in the nation. And you're gonna see some dispersal of that innovation. For example, I think St. Louis is gonna be another center of innovation. I believe that the key to innovation and a growth in an economy, and I'm biased, is a world-class engineering university. Show me a firm that's accretes more than $10 billion in a given year, and I'll show you a firm that's a bike ride from a world-class engineering university. So Wash U, which has an incredible engineering university. I think St. Louis is about to ha get their first unicorns. I advise some elected leaders here in, in Florida, and I say, if you want Florida's economy to get to the next level, you need to have a world-class tech campus because the thing that the most talented young people in Florida have in common is that they leave. People are leaving San Francisco, it just got priced out, but they're going to other cities. They're going to Austin, right? They're going to other cities. So I'm bullish on cities. Rumor of their death has been greatly exaggerated. I think this is probably a good time to buy in six to 12 months in New York. 
best city in the world. San Francisco just got, the value proposition has just gone away from San Francisco. Uh, the bigger question is how California, Illinois, and New York cope with a vastly melting ice cube of tax revenue as states like Texas and California have no state income tax. So the wealthiest people who are the most mobile are basically just migrating to these high sunshine, low tax states. So bullish on cities, bearish on San Francisco. Scott, I have one final question for you. This has been a fascinating conversation to hear your thoughts on the future as we search for the future and everyone tries to make sense of the crazy year that we had in 2020. I sort of feel like I saw my favorite tweet of the year thus far has been a tweet that was, I think it was on January 6th. It was like, well, you know, I hope you're all enjoying December 36th, 2020. And uh, yesterday, I do feel like we turned the corner and maybe 2021 started. And so my question for you in closing, what do you see, what is the biggest opportunity going forward? So I write in the book a lot about economic opportunities, and we talk about healthcare, we talk about education, um, tapping into dispersion. I think if you're blessed with health and the ability to work at home, I think working all the time right now, I think you can make tremendous progress because probably some of your competition is hamstrung and can't be productive. But my second book was on happiness. I think about happiness a lot, and I don't think it's something you and you know, I think it's something you need to work out. I think it's a skill, just like anything else. If you want to be great at being happy and living and feeling a rewarding life, I think it's something you have to practice and be mindful of. I, I think the profound opportunity is that uh, we're in a crisis and we give medals to young men and women in uniform when they are selfless and put themselves in harm's way and they're generous and show grace in terms of caring for other people. They they sacrifice their own well-being or they're willing to take risks to help other people. And I think that all the studies on happiness, generally speaking, point to one thing, and that is the happiest people are people who have very deep, meaningful relationships with um, friends, coworkers, and family. And I think this is an extraordinary opportunity to ask yourself three questions. Um, do you, uh, is this an opportunity to pivot to being a real caregiver for your parents? At our age, I think a lot of people uh, uh, get used to the muscle memory of their parents taking care of them. Is this an opportunity to really become the caregiver you want to be for your parents? I think people need to ask themselves, do they have the relationship with their siblings that they want? If they were, if they were forced to say goodbye to one of their siblings over FaceTime, is your relationship where you want it to be? And finally, have you made the requisite investment in friendships? Have you let perceived slights or competitiveness or other bullshit get in the way of friendships? Because if you, if you feel like you have an opportunity across any of those and you're blessed enough to have good health, economic security, the opportunity to show grace and generosity and forgiveness and to affirmatively reach out to people presents a profound opportunity. And that's for the repair and the cementing of what is the key to happiness. And that is deep, meaningful relationships. So there are meaningful opportunities professionally, but the profound opportunity is to accomplish in weeks what other might, otherwise might take years, and that's for the repair and cementing of key relationships. Well, that is a perfect place to end today's talk. What a profound way to escalate and have some positivity in the moment here. I think we're all feeling more positive than we felt in the last couple years and certainly more than last year in the past couple of days. I was watching you tweet yesterday, Scott, the, the inauguration, the poetry, the all the events of yesterday. I certainly felt the same way. It's been awesome to talk with you and I thank you for being a guest here on Yex Talks and am, uh, am very excited to continue to watch how all this plays out. And I'm going to think about how I can go and have more meaningful relationships with my family and maybe my friends. Thanks. Thank Thanks for saying much. that, Howard. Congrats on your success. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.